Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Spitfire on my tail, part 7. Hinnak, right from the beginning, was very ambitious. He was the son of a farmer who seemed always to count himself so lucky to have been accepted into the Luftwaffe. Certainly I felt privileged, but Hinnak felt something deeper than this, almost beholden to the government for offering him the chance to serve as an officer. Willy Hofmann was a really happy-go-lucky lad, always in the highest of spirits, taking the hardest knocks with good humor. He also seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of poems, both classical and, of course, those that were a little crude. He even made some up of his own, and these too seemed to be of a high standard and very popular as an evening diversion. Willy's father was a train driver for the Reichsbahn, which, if you consider the mixture in just our room, demonstrates the truly classless selection of the Luftwaffe. It was a case of the best man for the job, and this was to be carried on later, even under combat conditions. However classless the selection, I have to comment that I think that Willy was badly suited to the Luftwaffe, perhaps not having enough concentration when flying. Often he would sing at the top of his voice whilst heading for some potential catastrophe. Early on in the course we were being given a lecture in navigation by a Luftwaffe Major, who put the question to Willy, Fähnrich Hofmann, he said. You are in a blind flying situation and in command of the aircraft. In flight, your radio operator tells you that the radio fuse has blown and that there is no spare. What do you do? We all knew that Willy had no technical sense at all and could see that he was completely lost. Well, as Willy was standing out in front of the class and facing us, and the Major was watching Willy with his back to us, we all started to make signs to him, indicating smoking and opening of cigarette packets. What we were trying to get across was that he should use the aluminum foil from a cigarette packet to mend the fuse. Suddenly there came the dawn of realization over Willy's face. He cleared his throat with great ceremony and with inestimable pride said, I would, Herr Major, with complete calmness, smoke a cigarette whilst I further consider the problem. As can be imagined, the class dissolved into helpless laughter, the Major included. He just shook his head in defeat and simply said, You've passed. It might be that this was not a favor for Willy as later, in the early days of the French campaign, he was killed in 109. I often wondered if he had been singing or maybe he was admiring the clouds when the shells hit his plane and snuffed out his carefree life. He was never cut out to be a soldier and both his youth and his talent were squandered for nothing. At that time we weren't thinking too much about future dangers. We were conscious that we were training to be pilots and that one day we would fly the fighters and bombers of the Luftwaffe. But I don't remember that we much considered what horrors of war might hold for us. Right then, we were just an energetic bunch of boys on the edge of a fantastic adventure and every day took us closer to the realization of our dreams. Before the next phase of our training began in earnest, we were given leave to visit our homes. What a contrast this visit was to the last one when I'd still been in the early days of my basic training. I was brimming full of excitement about flying school and frankly I couldn't wait to get back to barracks. There was obvious relief from my parents that things were now going well and it was with a really light heart that I returned to Berlin. Werder, the little town near to our airport, was famous in its own right as a resort for the Berliners. The pride of Werder was its Baumblüte, which means flowering trees. That is, cherry, peach and plums. Meanwhile, on the ground, there were masses of strawberries. In the season, it was a paradise of different scents, a real wonder. The local farmers would sell their goods both wholesale to the traders and retail to those who wanted fruit for jams and wine. During the four weeks, from the middle of May to the middle of June, varying by a few weeks according to the weather, the Berliners would come out in droves and experience the Baumblüte and to drink the local wine, made from the cherries and peaches, very unusual. It was very sweet and quite strong, resulting in many headaches the next day. During the season we weren't allowed out too much and even when we did go out we had to wear civilian clothes. These we had brought back from our leave for this specific purpose. On the whole we weren't too worried about not going out during Baumblüte because there were so many people about and too many drunks. You couldn't go anywhere without someone wanting to pick a fight with you or just messing up the evening by behaving badly. We were glad when all the invaders went off back to Berlin. The only advantage was that there were many more dancers and lots of girls about who soon got to know us well. Back at the school we were amazed how the attitudes had changed. We were actually treated like humans and not like a low form of life. 
we had completed some of our theory and soon it was time for us to take our first, however faltering, steps toward the aircraft. For initial training we used two types. The Heinkel Kadett HE-72, a biplane which had a 140 or 160 horsepower radial engine and two seats in tandem, the pupil sitting at the front, and the Fokker-Wolf FW-44 Stieglitz, which was similar to the Heinkel, both being certificated for full aerobatics. When the day came for the first flight, we were all nervous. I suspect that most of us were having the same thoughts, having come so far and hoped for so much, what would happen if we were frightened? How could you face your comrades if you were airsick down your flying coat? We were all sure that we wanted to fly, but could we do it when the time came? On the great day, we were all too busy to feel too emotional about the forthcoming event. There was a great bustle as we grouped up, ready for the flight. The aircraft were being run up by the instructors and the ground crew. When they were ready, they waved the first candidates over to the cockpits and waited for them to strap in. At the drop of a flag, the instructor would take the aircraft up for about five circuits and land ready for the next candidate. When it was my turn, I doubled across to the plane and saw the grinning face of the previous pupil as he passed me. It can't be so bad, I thought as I stepped into the blustering prop wash from the idling radial engine. I climbed up and dropped into the cockpit, feeling for the straps to secure me with shaking hands. Then I felt the engine falter for a second and then roar into full life. The wind buffeted the short screen in front of me as I struggled to see past the engine that rose in front of my eyes. The whole airframe shook as the power was applied by the instructor and then the aircraft began to move. Slowly at first, as it veered left and right to allow the pilot to see forwards then, the short wait for the all clear, and abruptly the engine's note rose to a new high and the plane surged forwards, gathering speed at what was a phenomenal rate in my experience. For someone like me, who had only ridden trains and some very basic cars, this surge of power and the experience of such acceleration was unique. However, this would be nothing to the pure exhilaration which I later felt when releasing the 1175 horsepower of the Daimler-Benz engine of my 109. Quickly the tail came up and I could see clearly ahead through the silvery blur of the spinning prop. Then I had a sudden feeling of lightness and I realized that I was flying. In an instant, my anxiety was gone. This was where I wanted to be. We gained altitude and I didn't know where to look next. I could see outside the airfield and many of the roads running far off into the distance. I could feel the little plane rise and fall in the air and was conscious of the adjustments to the engine speed that were being made by the pilot. Between my knees I could see the control column moving as the instructor controlled the aircraft and, down by my feet, the rudder bar moved in eerie autonomy. I wanted to start right then and there, but it would be a couple of days before I took those controls for the first time. The flight instructors had nothing to do with the military establishment and the chief instructor of our Fluggruppe was also a civilian, Herr Harms. He was a very nervous type of individual and we were told that he had already been involved in several air crashes with students. Apparently he had been injured on several occasions, sometimes seriously and, as a souvenir, still had a silver plate in his head. He had three instructors and each of these would be assigned 10 to 12 men. Ours were Unteroffizier Haberkorn, Herr Grote and Graf Perponche. We didn't have fixed instructors at first, but later, after some doubt had been registered about the quality of instruction, it changed. After a very short period of dual flying and very limited theoretical training, we were expected to go solo. This really was nerve-wracking in the extreme, especially when you see several of your colleagues having very near misses before you. Many seemed to have the same problem. They would open the throttle fully for takeoff run and then inexplicably make a very sharp left turn. Careening across the airfield, they would make for the barrack block, which was a very substantial two-story building with a high-pitched roof. One fellow managed to cut the engine before it became fully airborne, but another took off and missed the top of the roof by a few meters. He then disappeared from our view as he dived into the courtyard behind the barracks. Then, with a roar of the radial engine, he soared up again as close to a complete stall as he could fly. He then completed his circuit and landed. I don't know who was most shaken by the experience, us who watched, or the chap that flew. Soon it was my turn and, having seen my friend's close call with the barrack roof, I was more than a little nervous. I had flown about 40 to 45 circuits with the instructors, but I didn't really think that I was ready for a solo yet. This was a problem with the constantly changing instructors. 
Nobody had a really accurate idea of each individual student's capabilities. It was just a case that if the instructor of the day felt that you were ready, you did your first solo. As I sat alone in the cockpit of the aircraft, it was more than the vibration of the engine that made me shake. My mouth was dry and I found that I was gripping the control column as though it was life itself. Feet on the rudder bar and left hand on the throttle, I was as ready as I could ever be. Then the flag was dropped and slowly but firmly I pushed the throttle lever forwards. The engine misfired slightly, then began to run up smoothly, adding more power to the propeller and I began to roll. Before the aircraft reached takeoff, the only controls I had were the individual brakes on each wheel and the throttle. I had to wait until I had enough speed to get sufficient airflow over the rudder to give any real steerage from the rudder bar. Now came the big surprise for me. I had to exert a massive push with my legs to get the rudder to respond at all. This had been one of the problems which had been brought about by our instructors. It seemed they had never really trusted us to take complete charge of the aircraft on takeoff. Apparently, they had always taken most of the rudder control and thus we had never really felt the full weight before. I soon learned to be brutally assertive with the aircraft. I really took command and managed to fly the machine rather than respond to its apparent wants. After the first, almost disastrous solos, the system was changed and we were allocated in small regular groups to one singular instructor. In this way, he became much more familiar with our strengths and weaknesses and, as a result, we began to do much better. The first hurdle for the young pilot was the so-called A2 license. This required a given number of solo flights, the practicing of emergency landings both with and without the instructor. On the occasions when we were to make emergency landings solo, we would fly to a designated field out in the country where one of the other instructors was waiting. At about 200 meters we would cut the engine by switching off and glide down to about 2 or 3 meters from the ground before cutting the motor in again. The instructor would either signal that we had passed or that we were to do it again. Another exercise like this began at about 700 meters above the landing cross. Here, once more, the engine would be cut and we had to glide the aircraft down in a spiral circuit to finally line up and land close to the cross. This had to be achieved without schnipsen, which means light and carefully applied touches of throttle. Some of us became very dexterous at applying the delicate little touches of throttle to better control the aircraft and to give a little lift without the keen ears of the instructors picking up any engine noise. It was fair game to try to fool the instructors, but it was a matter of honor to own up to this little game of cheating to the other members of the group once the instructors were out of earshot. The training was good and developed the skill of side slipping. This was to prove very useful later when landing the 109 under adverse conditions. The A2, if I remember correctly, required 2000 kilometers of cross-country flying. I remember my first flight to Magdeburg where I was to make a landing on the very much enlarged airfield. It was the first time I'd ever been there and would therefore have no idea of landmarks. Before takeoff, we had to get the weatherman to give us his forecast and to stamp our Bordbuch. Then the instructors would check the barograph and the tail of the aircraft so that, upon our return, they could see if we had been flying level and at the correct height. You must remember that we had no radio and there was no such thing as air traffic control at the time. Similarly, if we got lost, it was our quite illegal practice to find a railway station from the air and then to dive down low enough to read the station sign and find out where we were. This too would show up on the barograph and earn the unlucky pilot a heavy rebuke from the instructor. My first long distance flight to Magdeburg was to be a real education for me. It was a case of trying to consolidate all of the theoretical work into a practical result. We had had some time to prepare our routes at our desks, taking into account wind speed and drift, air speeds and fuel consumption. The flight plan had been checked and approved and it was with confidence in the navigation but apprehension about the flight that I started up and taxied ready for takeoff. I was soon airborne and knew that I would have to adopt my first compass heading. There was the first problem. The compass wouldn't settle. In theory, you just glanced at the compass which would read 270 degrees and follow that course. In practice, it swam before my eyes varying by tens of degrees. The result was that I very soon became lost and had to find my way back to Werder. There, I started out once more and this time I flew a little steadier, cutting down the compass swing. Learning to fly long distance solo was a very sobering experience. If I had to say that there was one single part of my training where most things came together and I learned the most, it would have been there in that lonely windy cold cockpit. It really was a kind of maturing for us and for some the effect was much more dramatic. 
From our company, which was 120 men, we lost about 10 trainees whilst they were accruing kilometers cross country for their A2 and B run licenses. 10 men and 10 aircraft, a staggering price. Young hopes, dreams and lives were obliterated in a few seconds. The epitaph, a tangle of aluminum, wires, oil and fuel mixed with the wreckage of a body which had once served the soul of a friend and colleague. It was not only on the cross country that we lost our pilots. More often it was due to the practice of unscheduled aerobatics at a time when we had not been fully trained in control. Looping the loop was a popular maneuver as were short periods of practice dogfighting. These extracurricular activities were difficult to monitor by our supervising instructors when we were just a group of trainees out on a squadron strength cross country. Five to seven of the little biplanes would take off and form up, making for a common objective. During the flight it would become obvious that one or more of us were ready for a little unscheduled activity. Before long each of us had become involved in dangerous maneuvers and unfortunately sometimes the consequences were fatal. Then for a few days we would all become model trainees but it never lasted long. The trouble was that we instructors didn't fly with us at all on the cross countries. We had to fly the nest sometimes and unless we were observed, they had no idea what we were up to. During the flights, the unscheduled descents to read rail station signs or directions on the motorway would be spotted on the barograph record, but maneuvers whilst airborne did not show up. There would be a slight climb, then a drop in altitude and a slight climb again. On the barograph, it was just an apparent reaction to turbulence. In fact, it had been a high-speed loop which had stretched the control of the trainee to the limit. Young people will always stretch themselves to their limit, it is all part of growing up. The trouble with doing this in the air is that nature is completely unforgiving of this youthful folly. If you lose control, you can't just pull up, recover your wits, then have another go. You die. Recognizing that it was the unscheduled aerobatics which caused most of the fatal accidents, the instructors tried as best they could to limit our games. They soon realized that many accidents had taken place in the vicinity of a pupil's parents, girlfriends or relatives home. The cause was apparent, just showing off. Soon they had a register of all significant sites for the pupils and training routes were designed to avoid this kind of temptation. I, for instance, had a statutory ban imposed upon me for crossing the Main River to the south of Stuttgart, let alone getting near the town itself. I personally didn't have too many narrow escapes. I don't know if I was naturally more skilled than the others or more cautious, but I don't think that either was the case, maybe I was just lucky. Those that did occur were usually beyond my control. The closest I ever came to death during the early days of my training was a case in point. When I recall the memory of this, even after all the years that have since passed, I still feel the knot of panic in my stomach, the smell of petrol, shouts of alarm and willing hands trying to pull me from the twisted mass which had, seconds before, been my aircraft. Accidents happen when you least expect them. That seems to be a fairly universal rule. This day was no exception. I remember that it was sunny and clear with a light wind, ideal flying weather. We were all flying circuits and bumps, that is, takeoff and landing, with one circuit of the airfield. There was a strict control by means of flags and, when danger threatened, by use of flares, either red or green. I had finished four or five circuits and was making my way back to the neutral zone behind one of the other trainees. I was keeping a very close check on our spacing, ensuring that I didn't run into his tail. With the tail of my aircraft down and the engine rising in line of sight, this was only achieved by swinging the aircraft left and right on something of a serpentine course by using alternate brakes. This of course required concentration and we tended to rely on the other pilots to play their part and to avoid us in turn. As we made our way across the field I concentrated on the front left because this was where I could see the aircraft in front. Quite why I didn't know to this day, but I suddenly looked to the right, towards the takeoff line. To my horror, I saw the silvery spinning blur of a propeller and the menacing outline of an aircraft as it hurtled towards me on a collision course. I had less than a second's warning. It must have been sheer instinct which made me duck down into the relative safety of the cockpit, just before the shattering impact of the propeller. I was thrown sideways and felt the pressure of the mangled wreckage pressing down on me. There had been a tremendous rending of metal and splintering of wood, but I was still aware of regular high-speed impacts as something, which I took to be the propeller of my aircraft, continued to beat. From the overwhelming experience of the initial collision, I gradually began to 
be able to sort out different sounds and feelings from the overall trauma. The vibration and hacking of the prop, the tearing and crushing of the structure of the aircraft and the knowledge that I must act immediately. Ignition off was the phrase which burned in my mind. Must get the ignition off. Bent over the stick, I was aware that the instrument panel was above my head. I felt upwards cautiously to where I thought the switches might be and found the toggle switch which controlled the electrics. I switched it off. Then I became aware of a metallic pinging sound as hot metal cylinder fins and exhaust manifolds began to cool and the menacing pts, pts, pts as fuel from ruptured feeder pipes dripped onto hot metal. I then became conscious of the shouts of my friends and colleagues as they made their way towards the tangled mass. Over the top of the others I could hear the almost hysterical voice of Mr. Harms as he shouted, Get out! Get out! Fire! Fire! I suddenly came fully to my senses and tried to move, but I was firmly held in place. I was still in my harness and one of the cylinders of the radial engine of the other plane was pinning my shoulder. My stomach knotted with fear as I imagined the sudden explosion and fire, the horrors of slowly burning to death erupted into my mind. I had to swallow a scream and try to think calmly. Willing helpers reached into the tangled mass and pulled at my clothing, nearly wrenching my arms from their sockets, but still I was held firmly. In what was actually only minutes but seemed like hours, enough help arrived and the two aircraft were physically ripped apart and I was released. As I looked back at the tangled mass of wreckage, I felt fortunate indeed to have only suffered minor injuries. There had been no fire. Luck must have smiled upon me that day. Flight training has finally begun for Ulrich and what a rush that must have been. I myself have a little, very little experience but some experience nonetheless, with piloting small single-engine aircraft and even those few hours were extremely fun, so I can really empathize with him here. But one can only imagine the danger back then, with limited avionics and no radios in the trainer aircraft. Ulrich himself suffered a major accident just because someone else did not pay enough attention. But rest assured, it will not dissuade him from going on and we will learn about that in the next episode. I will see you then. Cheers. Bye bye.